Welcome to the Brilliantly Resilient Podcast. What's your train wreck? Everyone has one. The question is, are you going to live there or are you just visiting? Let's check in with Mary Fran and Kristen to learn how to come through not broken, but brilliant. Hey everyone, before we dive into this week's episode, we have a resource that we wanted to tell you about. Transform every week of yours with our brilliance bit that will deliver right to your email inbox. Sign up for it at brilliantlyresilient.net and keep living brilliantly resilient. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Brilliantly Resilient Live. I'm Kristen Smedley here with my buddy Mary Fran Bon Tempo. And our new buddy that we're going to introduce you to now. I am I am really excited about today because I got to tell you, you, okay, first of all, this is Yvonne Caputo, <laughs> an author, um, and like I said, now one of our one of our buddies. And and what we're going to be talking about today, amongst other things, is this element of storytelling and sharing stories within families and building relationships. And and Yvonne's two books um, are about her dad. And I have to tell you, Yvonne. I have always said if I could be half the storyteller that my dad is, I would that would be the happiest thing for me because I grew up, I have four brothers, and we grew up with my dad. He he taught me everything about life through stories, stories that he would make up. He would tell me, I mean, he I always say that uh, people say, How are you so optimistic and resilient? I'm like, I was raised by this amazing storyteller that even had great stories of being in the Vietnam War. Like he only told me the the funny ones and the he didn't want me walking around with this heavy experience that he had had. And he also said that, that the Vietnam War changed his life. For the better, you know. So being raised by somebody like that, you tend to have um, a healthy dose of optimism. So I'm excited to dive into to your journey and why you've written the books that you've written. So thanks for joining us today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, you know this this element of storytelling. I should also add, we didn't have much growing up. Like we, my parents moved us out of the city to make sure that we could have a a better life and go to private schools and all that. So we didn't really have much extra. But this whole thing with with storytelling and music was big for us, too. But music, you know, it's it's I love listening to lyrics of songs to hear the story that the artist is telling. So so let's dive into this a little bit about this whole element of, of story in your family and background. My mother was really the storyteller um, and dad, if he told a story, it was generally tagged on to a joke. However, <laughs> In 2008, on a dark, dreary uh, January night, on our weekly phone call, Dad lived in the western part of Pennsylvania. I'm here in southeastern Pennsylvania. And he told me this quirky, funny, off-the-wall story about making an emergency landing in a B-24 bomber with its third engine out. And the third engine is where the hydraulics are. So it's kind of an important engine. <laughs> And when he's doing it, I went and said, Dad, hold on a minute. I want to get a piece of paper. I want to write this down. His exact words to me were, what the hell do you want to do that for? <laughs> and I said, hey, I think this is something the family really would like to know. And then the next week, just like this aha moment, I said, Dad, if you're willing, start at the beginning. And he did. And story after story after story rolled off of his tongue from graduating from high school through the Great Depression to not having a job to learning to repair airplanes wow. um, to having a presidential deferment that would have kept him out of the war to building a wing for an AT-6 using the blueprints. Never built a wing before, but since he'd made models in childhood, figured he could do it. Flew in that plane. And then when he was flying, he said to me, "Hun, I didn't want to fix him anymore. I want to fly him. Yeah. So he petitioned to get out of his deferment. And he ended up as a cadet in the United States Army Air Force. Wow. And so that's where it all began. That's where the book began. So the interesting thing to me is that that seems to open up a doorway 
for you to even greater conversations like this, uh, you know, we all, we all see and know the people in our lives in a certain context, what we tend to not know mostly about those who are even closest to us, because we have other images of, of those that we aren't as close to, but what we don't know about the people who are closest to us is some of their greatest stories, their best experiences, because we don't know them in that context. And they have no reason to share themselves with us in that context, because, you know, you would think a parent has nothing to do with that younger self with it, with his child. But those stories can be so incredibly valuable for helping us to know our, those closest to us as, as whole people. So is that what kind of started to drive you after you heard that first story? Well, first of all, it was the history. I love history. I had a great history professor in college that turned it around for me. But what started to happen when dad started to talk is that the more I asked questions, the more he revealed, the more he trusted me, the more he started to open up. So a little different for you, Kristen, is dad told me about the nightmares. Dad told me about the flashback. And I'm a psychotherapist, so I could explain to dad how his nightmares were normal to the trauma that he witnessed oh. and that his flashback was normal to the trauma that he had witnessed. And, and in this process, uh, Mary Fran, something happened, and that's I began to understand my father on a deeper level. I began to see how and why he couldn't necessarily re relate to me in perhaps the way I wanted because of who he ultimately was. So one of the major things that came out of writing the book for me is that I say this frequently, I got the dad I always wanted and he got a daughter he didn't know he had. <laughs> <laughs> and in all of the things, he waited for me to get back to my childhood home to be there for his final journey. Mm. He trusted me and waited so that I could be with him when he went. So do you think that on some level that may have been a result of that kind of new relationship that you built up? over that period of time because your second book is about talking about your father's passing and how you ended up those ended up being the kind of conversations that you had so you you kind of went through a whole literal lifetime of conversations it sounds like we did we really did um and you're absolutely right the conversations led to my being able to talk to dad about death and dying and we had done an advanced directive together. I was working at a retirement community and finding out how absolutely critical these legal documents are. And this is naming your healthcare agent, somebody who can speak for you when you can't, um, what kind of medical treatment you want or do not want in the end. But there was another document called the five wishes. And it took an advanced directive and brought out all the heart. And I sat beside my father in his uh, hospital room and asked him, how do you want to be remembered? What do you hmm. want your children to know? Hmm. Do you want to be cremated or do you want to be buried? What do you want your funeral to be like? So this beautiful document layered these questions for me. So, so in the end, not only was I his healthcare agent, again, but I knew so much more about what made my father tick. He wanted to be remembered for his work with the Red Cross. Now, hmm. after I wrote the book, the first draft, I found out that he had been a Red Cross volunteer for 41 years. Wow. And, and you didn't, didn't know, know that? that? I didn't know it. So the book, by the way, writing the book led me to discovery after discovery after discovery. So even after his passing, I'm learning about the man I called my father. Um, but in the doing of the five wishes, 
when the EMTs were working on him, I picked up the phone and called the uh, hospital and I said, you've got a DNR, a do not resuscitate order on dad's chart. Get it over to the emergency room because they're bringing it in. Mm. Luckily, the doctor in the emergency room called the EMTs and said, you can stop working on Mike. Hmm. And so I laid down beside him, told him that I loved him, told him that I knew he was going where he wanted to go, that he was ready. The glue in our family was the Lord's Prayer. So I said that in his ear and he passed away. Wow. And he got exactly what he wanted was to be carried feet first out of his own home. So the other piece that's added on to getting to know my dad on that level is I don't grieve his loss in the way I grieve the loss of so many others because knowing what he wanted, I could make sure that his wishes were honored. And there's such grace and joy in that. Do I miss him? Absolutely. Would I like him back here in a heartbeat? You betcha. But all in all, still, to be able to say to you and to the world at large with dying with dad, that by knowing what folks want, we can ease that transition, not only for them, but for ourselves. That's interesting. That is really interesting about, I like this, this, this five wishes, especially that question of what do you want to be known for? Let me ask you this, though, Yvonne. So you had this, this incredible journey with your dad of, of hearing his stories, putting them in the book, and then being able to be there at, at the end and have this incredible transition. What, back us up, though, to, to the growing up, how is, how is it that you didn't know that he was in the Red Cross for 41 years is volunteering? Is, was he just like a, he quietly served the world and, and didn't say much about it kind of guy? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I had known that he worked on emergency services. He was on a team of people that bought, brought updated emergency services to all of Crawford County in Pennsylvania. I knew that. I knew that he had volunteered during the big flood in Meadville in 1959. Um, I knew that, but I never knew that he had carried on after that date to continue wow. in, in working with the Red Cross. So wow. little things like that. Wow. It's interesting that we that we keep people in certain places. Like even after we start to know things about them, we still kind of revert back. So it takes that conscious, intentional inquiry, I think, into the people's lives of those that we love to really find out. We take so much for granted when we're with people that are close to us every day. And, and you know, to Kristen's point of what people want to be known for, to just to ask that question is is honoring them for let me know what's important to you when we don't and ask it, that question it was interesting too because when i asked dad the question and he told me about the red cross i said well what about world war ii his response was this and that too <laughs> but it was like you know okay so that was a long time it, what the way i took it was it was a long time ago no big deal when I know, having done a lot of research about World War II and my dad's participation in it, it was very much a big deal. For three years when he came home, he had the same nightmare. Mm. He would wake up in the middle of the night screaming. My mother started by asking him, what's this all about, Mike? And he wouldn't say. He said, I'm fine. Don't worry about it. I'll go back to sleep. But his nightmare was that his B-24 had been hit and it was going down. And he was trying to get through this narrow passageway to get to the bomb bay so that he could drop out, so that he could parachute out. He couldn't get through it. He kept telling me that the sides were stainless steel and I couldn't get purchase. I couldn't pull myself through. He said, but I always woke up. I always woke up before the plane hit the ground. That nightmare lasted three years. It was so bad that dad dug channels into the mattress. Wow. Um, I, I didn't know it. 
I mean, this is something that he did tell me. So when he said the Red Cross, and then he said, and that too, about the Second World War, I was like, wait a minute, you came home with nightmares and it's that too? Yeah, yeah. Wait, so so he went three years with the nightmares. Did he say what finally, did he start, you know, some kind of uh, post-traumatic therapy or something? Well, Christian, at that, in those days, there was nothing. All right, there was absolutely nothing. Um, PTSD wasn't recognized. Therapeutic treatments for it weren't available. When he told me about it, I said, it makes me sad, Dad, because nowadays you could have received help, which would have taken you a place where the nightmares wouldn't have lasted that long. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and dad and I used sarcasm to the nth degree. So at the end of this conversation, I said to him, I said, so sorry, pal, you're normal. And your nightmares <laughs> were normal. Um, so, so those kinds of things were, were a part of the storytelling that happened between dad and I. And I literally, when he told me about the nightmares and I told him that he was normal, I literally could hear his shoulders drop. Mm. That finally, after all of these years, someone could explain something to him that he didn't understand. So I'm, I'm actually curious, when you got to the point where you started having these conversations about death and dying what was his initial reaction i mean my mother my mother's 85 and thank god she's in she's in excellent health and but i i can't help thinking like at what point do you discuss that how do you bring this up i mean i was his reaction open to it or was he more i'm not gonna talk about that because i think you could get both responses um, he was very much open to it, but I was able to say, hey, dad, we just had this case in the retirement community where one of our residents didn't have an advanced directive mm -hmm. written in the state of Pennsylvania mm -hmm. and her wishes couldn't be honored. Mm -hmm. And when the time comes, I want to know what you want so that, you know, to the best of our ability, we can do that. Is this something you'd be willing to do with me? And he said, yes. And so I made uh, arrangements with the local attorney in Meadville, Pennsylvania. And he and I went down and sat through and she created the document. And that was something that we then had, you know, oh. um, he wasn't resistant at all. But I can tell you that people who have read the book it has changed the way they think about it. I had an older gentleman tell me that on his birthday, he told his daughters he wanted to Zoom with them. He wanted to Zoom all with all the family. He wanted to go over the five wishes with them. Mm -hmm. He had learned of the five wishes from me. So then he went out and did it. When they came to the time of burial and things like that, he said he wanted to be cremated. And so they said, hey, dad, what do you want us to do with your ashes? And he said, oh, I don't care. Throw them over the bridge. <laughs> and they said, wait a minute. Wouldn't you like them to be spread out at the farm? This man had grown up in a one room farmhouse out in the plains of Canada. Hmm. And he said, oh, that's too much trouble. I don't, I don't want you to bother. And they said, it wouldn't be a bother. It would really be an honor. And so he said, okay, I'll go back and I'll rewrite that section of the five wishes. Oh. So if that's what you would like to do, that's what you can do. Another comment that I received from somebody who was maybe in her 40s, that her parents had tried to bring it up, death and dying and what they wanted. And she would all always say, I don't want to talk about it. It's too soon. Let's not go there. However, in reading the book, she now understood that those were discussions that you really did need to have with them because yeah. you never know. Yeah. I, I only know about know. it from my mother, my mom experiencing the challenges with her family members that were 
in hospitals and and then when their their kids didn't that nobody had anything in place and she said it is so hard on the people that have to make decisions if there's no decision ahead of time she didn't want that for all of me and my brothers and I of course then I was like we're talking about this entirely too much mom because she was my mom is very much like a get things done right and then she went she, I got her an attorney friend of mine, right? And she's she's dragging my dad along, you know, checking all the boxes and doing all the things. And my dad is very sarcastic and funny too. His whole thing, his whole element to to planning and having this conversation, all he said, remember there's, I have four brothers and my mom, right? So his whole plan is that all he cares about is that at the funeral, he wants trumpets. Nobody knows why. He <laughs> wants trumpets. And he said that all of us, he said he wants to... <laughs> He wants the the service to be at 7.30 at night, but he wants wants everybody to advertise it as 7 o'clock and keep the door locked because he wants a line to form out front. And he said, all of us with our our spouses and kids have to be in the line. So it looks really long. That's what I'm dealing with here. (laughs) And he's adamant about that. And you know, it's interesting. A a very, very good friend of mine, an incredible man passed away right before Christmas. And my son and I were in the line. My son left his friends that were here um, on vacation from school and went with me to the service. And I, t- and, and Mitchell was kind of having a hard time in that line. And I told him the story of my dad, what he wants through the line. He started crying. He was laughing so hard. He's like, mom, pop up is the craziest, funniest guy. But yes, that's my father's contribution to the plan. My mother's got a whole other thing laid out. <laughs> I would imagine that that gives you an opportunity to add some levity sort of to some of these discussions too, though, right? Yeah, it it does. Because one of the things that dad said about the funeral was, he says, you know, that bit where people stand up and talk about you and they say these things. He said, I don't want that. If they haven't said it to my face, then they damn sure are not going to say it at the funeral. All right. (laughs) So when it came time for the funeral prep and we were, we were sitting with the priest and the priest said, well, do you want that? And I said, no, no, we don't want that. Um, so my father could be funny about those kinds of things too. Um, he wanted a high mass. He wanted my husband who has a beautiful tenor voice to sing. He named the songs that he wanted to sing. Mm-hmm. At one point, he, I told him that I was taking voice lessons and he said to me, and you will sing at my funeral as well. I did. Wow. It was not easy, but I did it because he asked me to do it. So when we're sitting with Father Gramada, my brother Michael said, gee, I don't I don't know what to tell you, you know, that we want to do. And I said, Michael, I know what dad wanted. So I just listed those things. So you're absolutely right, Kristen. It just makes it so much easier on the people who are left behind when they know those things. It just makes it so much easier. I would venture that it probably also becomes an opportunity for you to even share with siblings and other people these little insights into someone that they love so much, but may not be comfortable having those conversations with directly. So just to take that kind of initiative, you're kind of giving a gift to everybody else who cares for that person as well. It's exactly how I felt about it. And it's exactly how I I feel to this day. And it's, again, a part of that. I don't grieve the loss of dad the way I do do others because everything was in place. It was easier for my brother and sister. It was a whole lot easier for me. Um, When dad and I would, after we did the documents, when he and I would talk on the phone, he would sometimes just say, Yvonne, I'm so ready. I'm just so ready to go. He was a brittle diabetic. He was living alone in the house. He wasn't allowed to drive anymore. You know, his life was just not in any way, shape or form purposeful in the way he would have wanted it. So um, he would bring it up. And because he brought it up, then if he didn't bring it up, I would say, hey, how are you feeling these days? Are you ready or do you want some more time? And sometimes he would say, no, I'm not ready today. Maybe I will be tomorrow, but not today. So that back and forth conversation for us just became a whole lot easier. 
You know, I want to back up for a second to when you were talking about that, that your dad used a blueprint to build the wing of the plane and then flew that in that plane. Yeah. That's a man that has some serious trust and confidence in himself. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have done that. I <laughs> what makes it more interesting is when he asked for the blueprint, his supervisor said, well, how do you know what to do? And dad said, I built wings for model airplanes. A, a blueprint is a blueprint. And then he was 19. He was 19 years old at the time. And the pilot who was going to test this AT-6 knew how the wing got on there. So he came over to my dad and said, is it going to fly? And dad said, yeah. You're sure it's going to fly? And dad's response was, yeah. You're positive it's going to fly? And dad said, yeah. <laughs> and the pilot said, well, good son, get in. Because if it goes down, you're going down with it. I'd have done the same thing. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's, and that was one of the stories he told you. That oh was one God. of the stories. That's, that was one of the priceless. stories. So I said to dad at one time, I said, how did you do that? And he said, honey, I've just always been able to take something that's two dimensional and bring it into the third dimension. Hmm. He said, it's just always been something I've been able to do. Wow. wow. You, so confident. you found a bit of his brilliance right in there too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brilliance in, 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 and something that as a teacher, cause that's where, how I started out that I could really respect. And it's also not a skill I have. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> how long did it take? How, how many, off the top of your head, how many conversations did you have? How long was this process of hearing all these stories and getting this into into print? We started in January of 2008. And January of 2010, he passed away. Wow. So it was on and off for a couple of years. And, and the very last visit that I had with dad in the hospital. I took what was then, I believe, the second or third draft maybe, and I took it to him and that was his Christmas present. Oh, um, of the book, and, oh my. Yeah, and, and I read something um, to him. I went home on a Friday and dad did his dialysis treatment on Friday. And I would pick him up around five o'clock and we'd go out to dinner. And when I got to this, to the dialysis place um, and went in, his doctor was there and his doc was, doc was going over all the test results and how dad was doing with this and how dad was doing with that. And he then turned to my father and he said, Mike, you're passing out. So I'm telling you, you've got to give up your driver's license. Mm. And my father, <clears throat> little blue mouse, started cursing. And I can drive better than those potheads out on the road. What do you mean <laughs> I can't drive? And and Dr. Zellen just kept going on. And he said, Mike, if I hear that you're driving, I'll call the state and have your license rescinded. Mm. So we go home. I spend the whole weekend Sunday, I'm out on a trail riding my bicycle and I'm stewing. Am I going to take his keys away? Am I going to lift the uh, lid and take the rotor off the engine? Because then he can't start it. Am I going to hide the keys? What am I going to do? Because Dr. Sellen said he couldn't drive. So when I get back to the house early Sunday morning, my dad did as usual. He ordered me to make breakfast for him. And then he's sitting in this old chair that had wheels, like a desk chair. Mm -hmm. But the naga hide was split, was split. His donut cushion was sitting on it. It was just the rattiest thing. We couldn't get rid of it. And he's sitting there with his head down. And he starts mumbling again about driving. And then he lifted up his head and he said to me, but I gave my word. Mm. I didn't have to take the keys away. I didn't have to do anything. My father had given 
his word. Wow. Wow. So well, that's a, on. go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Go. That's okay. I mean, so, so those are just some of the kinds of things that happened between dad and I through the writing of this book. Wow. We had that moment too, with my dad was not being able to drive anymore. He had two strokes during COVID. And then they, they, we were like, you can't drive in the recovery. I mean, his recovery then was absolutely phenomenal. And I know it's because he was so stubborn. He wanted to get that license because he wanted a new Jeep. That was his, I was like, what motivates this man, right? He is so hilarious. Don't you know he was able to to rehab and get the, the license, but he still wasn't super confident on, on walking. I'm like, you can't walk into the stores and whatever, but you're going to drive to them. And he goes, hey, curbside pickup. It's a new thing after COVID. I was like, man, he is a determined person. And that's what he would do. Curbside pickup, Kristen. Oh my gosh, he's so fun. That's a hard, that was a very hard one though for him to have to 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 handle that independence when that is when that's gone. That was that was the hardest part of of that piece of the journey for all of mm-hmm. us to watch and have them then come around and and for your dad to then give his word that he wasn't going to is is huge. Mm. Yeah. But he was, you know, he was a man of honor. And that was not something until he said those words that really struck me. Okay, so I look at dad with all the childhood perceptions of the distance and the not talking and the being angry sometimes when it was not when there wasn't anything to be angry about. I had all those childhood perceptions of my father. I had different perceptions of my father as I, you know, continued to, to, to work on this. It, it's so interesting that if we allow ourselves to, especially as we get older and, and are more capable of the, you know, uh, absorbing and seeing the cognitive things and the processing and all that goes into people and the way they make decisions and the way they live their lives. If we make that effort to get to know these people that we think we know so well, it's amazing what we can end up finding out, not only about them, but about ourselves Mm -hmm. in the Mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, this has been a really illuminating conversation. and, And I would have to obviously urge everyone to have those deeper conversations not only about death and dying, but just asking the the life questions and the stories and find out about the people that you care about, because there's clearly so much more to them than we bring to our relationships with our, you know, our, our preconceived notions or our baggage, for lack of a better term, mm-hmm. uh, in our relationships with them. So where can everybody find the book, Yvonne? Both Flying With Dad and Dying With Dad um, can be ordered through any independent bookstore. It's available online at anywhere you purchase online books. Um, those are the places that it can be found. Okay, perfect. Awesome. So encourage everybody to have those conversations. And particularly if you're stuck about how to have them, I would say read the book and uh, get yourself a blueprint for figuring out how to have these interesting conversations. And the five wishes I can add can be ordered. It's $5. Oh, oh that's wonderful. That's a great It's $5 resource. for a pamphlet. It's a blue and white pamphlet. But they also sell how to have those conversations and give you background, you know. Oh, good. Um, yeah, it is. How, how to bring it up, how to talk about it. They do a lot of that. Um, it also, mine are done. My five wishes are done. I've discussed them with my children um, and I did it online because I type much better than I write. You know, I'm more fluid at a computer and then they save those for a year and I printed out a PDF and now all three of my children have a copy. My, my doctor has a copy. My attorney has a copy. Um, so I feel really good that my kids know. I, I'm not anxious, by the way, to go there, but, <laughs> but <laughs> it's nice to know it's off the no list. Rush. Yeah. No rush. Yeah. Yeah. There's no got rush. There's more, more things to do, books to write, things to say. Well, this yeah. has been uh, 
it, it has been quite a great time uh, talking with you, Yvonne. And as you're talking about and beaming about your dad, you just have me, my dad on my mind. And we've been wanting him to write down these stories that he told us as kids. And now I'm, I'm realizing that uh, I think that uh, we're going to have to triple, quadruple team him and and get the, the stories from him because they were really, really good. That would be a fun way to spend time with him uh, in the coming months and years, too. So thank you for that. Tape record it. Make it easy for him to just yeah. tell them. And then you've oh, got yeah. all the, all, you know, find somebody who's a typist or, or do it yourself. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. But look at that. Look, we can end up talking all day with all these different <laughs> things. Thanks so much for, for being here. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And if you want to get a, a nice little dose of Brilliantly Resilient once a week sent right to your inbox, we send the Brilliance Bit. That is a less than one minute read to help you keep living Brilliantly Resilient. Get it at BrilliantlyResilient.net. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to the Brilliantly Resilient podcast. Join our Facebook group and follow us on YouTube to be inspired with tools to reset, rise, and reveal your brilliance.